Well, it's February 1st and on the first day of Black History Month, the Bell County Public Health District hosted Colleen's first state of the black community address. Politicians, registered nurses, sororities and other city of Colleen stakeholders for community improvement gathered for the address and our Jordan Sarter Francis was there. Jordan, what were the takeaways? Lindsay and Chris, the three takeaways were health, health care and access to health care and the address wasted no time pushing this agenda. We are a community together. Together we stand, together we fall. Using teamwork to attack community issues was the elephant in the room at Colleen's first State of the Black Community Address. And I found out when I talked to the community, I'll find a different story. Using this event, Barry Sharp wants other leaders who could implement these benefits to add their opinions on what will work best. They have the funding now. Where will it do the most good? It's like voting, um, housing, um, and then we have issues of health care, quality and access, um, access to transportation, um, food insecurities, things like those, mental health. These are the list of things that Aaron Hughley of Bell County Public Health District hopes today's community address will improve upon. A part of the address was a panelist discussion that touched on these topics. Because we all have these amazing programs and initiatives that we are offering to the community and many people don't know about them. So hopefully if we collaborate. Hughley's concern being that the black community is unaware of services available. The state of the black community address was her effort to let the community know who is present to help and start, you know, taking care of your health. There are resources out here. All you have to do is pick the phone and call and. The state of the black community was a noble way to kick off Black History Month. With it being a first time event, it is surely a step forward for more than the 40% of black population of Colleen. Chris right. and Lindsay. Yeah, I appreciate that, yeah. Jordan. Thanks and for the health update. is wealth. If you don't Man. have your health, you don't have anything. Don't so. you know it. Awesome topic. Well, radio has certainly played a transformative role in the African-American community during the civil rights era and even today. Our Lindsay Lippman caught up with the voice of a generation on Waco's only hip hop radio station, Devin Patton, also known as DJ Precise. He's helped launch new artists and shine a light on issues in the black community, and he's just getting started. <laughs> For more than a decade, DJ Precise spreads positivity through the music and the mic. Moms and my grandmother, they instilled in me to always be positive and spread good news and don't spread hate, you know. So I press radio the same way. It's always positive energy, you know, because I never know what kind of day somebody else is having. I want to make their day better. His dream of becoming a DJ started at home. I mean, me doing DJing, it woke my mom, you know, because my mom would have parties at the house and she'd be like, son, go in there and get that Frankie Beverly and Maze, put that on right quick. And then I started picking, once I started listening and hearing the music, I'd go in there and just put stuff on while they're in there. She didn't have to tell me no more. She'd be like, boy, what you, what you know about Stevie Wonder over there, boy? You know what I'm saying? I'm putting Stevie Wonder on, I'm playing Prince, you know, Michael Jackson, and I'm watching everybody moving around, and I'm like, okay, this might be something I could do. As a teenager, he was hired to DJ at a local club, and his career in entertainment began. I was underage, you know, and they hired me as a DJ, my first DJ job. I was like 15, 16 years old. And the crazy part is the radio station, K104 is a big station. They used to come down to the club. And that's what made me, that's where my dreams of being on the radio came from. Because those guys used to come down, it was bad bread, all these different people that was on the radio back then. I used to go crazy, like, oh, man, they from the radio station, you know. And radio back then was, like, huge, you know. So that was, that's when I really started, like, man, I can really do this. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to His Eminence, the Pope. The, the greatest black radio personality in the world. Radio has been a touch point for the African American community. In the 1920s, Jack Cooper became the first African American radio disc jockey. Change makers like James Brown bought radio stations to help amplify black voices. And as hip hop marks its 50 year anniversary, the work being done by black broadcasters is just as important as ever. The FCC says only 1% of radio and TV stations are owned by African Americans, and only 5% of radio broadcasters are black. Honor our people and I salute our people that lived and died and fought for what we have today, you know, I salute them. I'm gonna do that for y'all next, look at that. I'm gonna mix that with that. When Waco's only hip-hop station hit the airwaves in 2010, 
local legend DJ Batman gave Sice his big break in radio. He's been part of Waco Radio history to give a voice and platform to the people. I just feel like we could all be better. And it starts with me. You know what I'm saying? It starts with you. It starts with me. Look in the mirror every day. Look at yourself. If you don't like what you see, change it. Now his new show, Texas Tap In, brings Texas culture to the world. We want the world to see what's going on in Texas. Like we're gonna we're gonna talk to the to the homeless man all the way up to the CEO, you know, the big the big artists all the way down to the little artists. He credits God, his family, and those who have gone before him. And I live not only for me, I live for my brothers, I live for my dads, my grandmothers, all them they all live through me. Like I really I really feel in my soul I got major guardian angels that, you know, have passed on. Black history moment, anybody out there watching this or listening to this. Just make yourself better. Start with you. That's going to make the black history continue to be better and for the world. We, we start with each with ourselves. For 6 News, I'm Lindsay Lipman. What a great story. And we got some beats in there so you can enjoy the rest of your night off that note. You can listen to DJ Precise daily on 107.3 in Central Texas or streaming online. And his new show, Texas Tap In, is up on YouTube. Go to KCNTV.com to get all of those links. Here in the city of Temple... Hundreds of people have earned their seat on city council over the decades, each to help make a change in the community. It's something Zoe Grant looked to do, too, when she moved back to Temple in 2016. Well, my parents uh, were from here, and so um, they're both deceased, but I came back to get more close to some of the relatives around here, get to know my heritage here. And as soon as she got here, she realized there was real work that needed to be done in certain parts of town. You'll see the difference in housing, um, the buildup of stores and um, fast food and bigger houses, you know, on the west side. And then you come to the east side, and you see a lot of homes that were at their original uh, building um, that are deprived, te tearing down, and people are still living in that. With that in mind, she decided to run for city council. I didn't, uh, people would say, well, do you think this is going to happen? Or uh, do you think you'll lose or win? It didn't bother me. I kept saying I have this. You know, I, I feel that God put me in this position. Leadership like this is not unusual for her family. Her uncle, Robert McLennan Martin, paved the way in the 1970s, being the first black Temple City Commissioner before today's city council was created. Hearing some of the things or when people know who I am, they'll say, oh, I know him and, you know, he, he did great things. But um, it's it's a heavy, it's a heavy thing to bear. And Grant added her name to the history books, becoming the first black woman to join Temple City Council. 2023, Juan in May, was installed and work began right away. No break in between. <laughs> but I did get, I do get training through uh, the city, so it's it's been a great, great um, reward of being able to serve the community. Councilwoman Grant's list of accolades spreads far. She's the current president of Temple's NAACP chapter and helped revive Temple's Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated chapter. Her own organization has a special place in her heart. It's a foundation that I started in 2019 because there was a need with the city of Temple about um, getting professional people to help them with uh, repairing homes. And so we went in and... Work doesn't ever stop for Zoe Grant, but it's all for the greater good of the city she loves. It's very important that the young people know um, someone like me can be in this position. Somebody like Barack Obama was president. You know, I can do anything my mind puts me uh, to do. So um, I think it's very important for um, even older uh, women to know I don't have to stay at home and, and, and just watch things happen on the news. I, I can get out there and make a difference. Definitely such a great time talking to Zoe Grant, and she says she would not have made it this far without God, the support of her two children, her family, and the community support. Guys. What an enlightening story. Yeah, really inspiring. And y'all are sorority sisters. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. I had to mention that. Yeah, Thanks course. so much, Adrian. Yeah. History Month, we are giving people their flowers while they are still living. Take a look at this image behind me. This is four generations all on one couch. And all new this morning, I had a chance to sit down with a Colleen woman who's lived more than a century of history.
You live and enjoy life. Let the good time roll. In this neighborhood off Rose and Taft Street in Colleen, there's a piece of living history. When is your birthday? 1918. Meet Muriel Elizabeth Bell, Ooh. or as everyone else calls her. She was born December 6, 1918. That's less than a month after World War I ended, making her 105 years old. 105 years, that is amazing. That's like what you read in the Bible, right? She's lived through eight major pandemics, several technological advances, and lived to see 19 presidents, including the first black man elected into office, Barack Obama. That was history that she saw made, right, that people never would have thought would have happened. She's also lived to see her great grandkids. Give me that smile again. Yep, go ahead. That's four generations on that couch. And let me tell you, Mother Bell, she's lived a life. If you missed it, boy, you missed it. She and her late military husband, Sergeant Bell, moved to Colleen when she was a young bride. The two even made history. Colleen was not integrated when they first got here. They moved into this neighborhood, right? They were one of the first families to integrate this neighborhood. The two raised a family together. How many children do you have? None. There you go. <laughs> to clarify, she did have two children. Why y'all them double questions? She was also the first black nurse at KISD. You liked working with those kids? Well, I like it now. I need a job. <laughs> You needed a job. In case you didn't notice, <laughs> she is hilarious. What what makes you happy? Yeah. Me? Yeah. I'll take the compliment. A man. <laughs> a man One of her favorite things to do, you would not expect from a 105-year-old woman. Can I dance with you? Oh. She's enjoyed dancing her entire life. I just dance all night long. You dance all night <laughs> And she still has rhythm. If you ask her what's the secret to living a long life, she'll tell you. Don't worry. People always worry about them. Truly is a blessing just to see the life that God can give you. Mother Bell is a living testimony that black history isn't just a thing of the past. It's Mother Bell. And she is black history. I tell you out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness, she was so <laughs> hilarious. You know, when you think 105, you don't yeah. think of someone you, who's usually in the right mind, able to walk and just, yes. I'm gonna be honest, Mother Bell, you're talking to me crazy. She has so much personality. I love yes. that story, Micah. I really do. Um, just smiling from ear mm -hmm. to ear as the story was playing. Mm -hmm. But yes, she is definitely, definitely full of personality. So, mm -hmm. Mother Bell. And I think just we, this image speaks yes. volumes. I mean, four generations on one mm -hmm. couch. Mm -hmm. How amazing is that that she can see her great grandmother? Yes. Well, it's a story of humbleness and perseverance from experiencing prejudice as a young boy to moving around the country. One Colleen man is inspiring those around him just one day at a time. You might have seen him in films or on YouTube. Six News reporter Sydney Deshaun got the chance to sit down with the Central Texas man and learn how he has made the most out of his special opportunities. I was a migrant worker. Both of my parents, uh, Haitians, came from Haiti. Will Molion and his family came to America on boat. I grew up in Florida as a Haitian boy in a Haitian community, not knowing anything about Americans. We would travel on the East Coast up and down all the states and pick fruits and vegetables. That's how we made our money. Experiencing disrespect along the way. It's interesting to grow up with prejudice of your own skin color. Many moves later, Molion and his family planted their roots in New York. We ended up in this place called Ray Creek with all white people. In fifth grade, he was met with the same disrespect. At the time, with my skin color, they didn't understand. I couldn't speak well. I didn't know how to really communicate. It wasn't until his teacher, Mrs. Hinkhouse, gave him a pep talk that changed his life. When I was really going through it, she saw me shut down, and she saw the vision more than I did. Story after story, Molion read his work to his classmates. They start laughing. I'm like, whoa. And she said, no, Will, keep reading. They are laughing at the story, not at you. So, it was a little click. Flash forward to high school, Molion became a basketball star, but made his way back to the arts. And I sneak in to just 
watch them act and do drama, not knowing anything about it. Mulione acted for a little while, later ending up in the military. I ended up doing 10 years. I did four tours uh, in Iraq. It's a lot of things that happened in, in the military that I've seen. He got out and decided to go to college. I just want to get a degree, do what everybody do. But I ended up getting an elective, and it was acting out of everything. He continued to excel in every part he played, but quit acting for a year. And I said, God, if you want acting for me, please let me know. A week later, I get a phone call to do a stage play. Lead role after lead role. Bro. Everything Not started right rolling from here. Mullion went viral on Vid Chronicles. That particular video is the one that has broke Great. everything. Like, I mean, literally, it comes back to me every week. Later winning the best. This is it right here. Male lead in the film Divided We Stand. To get an award of such, the same people who makes the Oscars and Emmy Awards made this award for me. Today, Molion sits back in clean, full of awe, as he gives all the glory to God. I did get discouraged at times, but I'll bounce back, say, Lord, you never failed me. And he hopes to inspire others along the way. No matter what your color is, no matter where you came from, no matter what you've done, as long as you have breath and you can find understanding, it's worth living, man. It really worth living. And that was Sydney Deshaun with that inspiring story. Terrific there. The Dr. Pepper Museum in Waco. Now, this museum is a beacon, I would say, to the city. Is sure to take you down memory lane. Here you go. Have a great day, guys. Thank it's you. more than just a soda or a float. One of the things that I'm really proud of is we've really been able to offer more and more to our visitors. More so the history lessons that emerge within. The civil rights movement was a struggle for black Americans to gain equal rights in the United States during the 1950s and 60s. In the corner of the soda fountain on the museum's property, there's a lesson to be shared. So we go through school, we learn about the civil rights movement, but it's really a surface look. We don't dive into the people's stories of the people who lived those experiences, the ones that sat at the lunch counter. Joy Summer Smith is one of the many involved in ensuring history is told correctly. Sit-ins brought the civil rights movement to small towns across the country and laid the groundwork for future social change. This replica 1960s lunch counter is designed to explain what sit-in movements were during the fight for civil rights. I'm hoping that they take the moment to pause and listen to the stories, really learn about the significance of this happening, that there were people that prior to the civil rights movement didn't have the power, the ability to sit with everybody else coming into a restaurant. With a touch of a hand, there's 10 minutes worth of perspective and stories from people who called Waco home. He said, y'all need to go home. Y'all need to start in trouble. We're not moving. And they didn't serve any of us. I said, I've been sitting there for nearly an hour. I want some service. And she said, well, we can't serve color folks here. I said, well, really, I didn't want no service, no color folks. I said, I really was wanting some bacon and eggs. Some stores, you know, I mean, they had cafeteria at two cafes up there that we had to go into the back if we went, you know, to eat there. They're the black local activists who were fighting for equality then to establish what society is now. My mother used to work at McCory's downtown on Austin Avenue. She shared with me how difficult it was during that period of time how black people could not eat at a lunch counter similar to what I'm sitting at now. That history is not only a, a nationwide problem we had during civil rights, but also right here in our city. So sitting here is kind of like we, we're, we're turning the corner, or at least trying to turn the corner. Anthony Better Sr. proudly sits on the Dr. Pepper Museum's board, where he was the first black board officer and then eventually first black board chair. For him, the sit down to take a stand exhibit is for all those who stood in the gaps. Looking at this exhibit and seeing the pictures, it automatically takes you back to that era. And also it's a reflection of the museum itself is trying to bring along peace and harmony, but tell the true history along the way.
It starts with people like Anthony, Joy, this exhibit, and the Dr. Pepper Museum to continue the legacy. The message is about equality, and we want people to learn from what happened previously um, so that as we move forward, um, we can keep that in mind and don't repeat those same mistakes. We live in a very diverse world, and our city is very diverse. We have families that are diverse, so we must face those challenges head on. And in doing so, we need to make sure the museum represents that very thing. The Difference Makers found desegregation in Waco. We got a letter from them. So I'm like, sorry, and blah, blah, blah. And it was a nice letter. And then at the, at, and the last thing was lunch on us. To share the taste of equality. As part of our Black History Month coverage, we're taking a look at the history behind the name of a trailblazer, George Washington Carver. Carver paved the way as one of the first prominent black scientists in the 20th century. Here in Waco, a middle school is named after him. Six News reporter Meredith Haas joins us live now in the studio to share the history behind the name. Meredith? Bailey Lindsay, graduates of one of the earliest black only schools in Waco are, are helping George Washington Carver's legacy live on through art. The future of G.W. Carver Middle School in Waco he has such a legacy that nobody knows about. will be molded <laughs> by iron. Through the sculpture, the future's open. It's, it's endless. Skip Rolls focuses his efforts on capturing George Washington Carver for who he was and his legacy at the middle school. It was a promising thing to us to be able to be a part of Carver and, and to establish roots here that we knew would would carry us through the rest of our lives. Growing up during the time of segregation, Ruth Jackson and Charles Perkins looked to the name G.W. Carver as a symbol of what they could achieve. We took pride in that name, just being associated with George Washington Carver. It was focused on educating students and providing them an opportunity to grow in their own environment, in their own community. Born in 1864. He was born into slavery. George Washington Carver grew up to be an agricultural scientist and inventor. His parents were slaves and they, they were owned by Moses and a lady named Carver. Most known for his work with peanuts, preventing soil depletion and promoting alternative crops to cotton. He was a trailblazer in his time. It shows that you can be whatever you want to be. You can do whatever you want to do if you try. But Ruth and Charles have one fear. It's so amazing now that the kids of today really don't understand what it really means to have one to, someone to be successful that looks like you. That's why they've teamed up with Waco ISD. The metalsmith um, entryway art piece is um, predominantly in honor of George Washington Carver. To have Skip twist. 80 feet long piece of metal mold that incorporates peanut vines, some history of the school. And burn the iron. A peanut bench, a huge bust of George Washington Carver. That will sit in front of the new middle school. Education is endless. To represent a new life for the school itself after the original burned down in 2021. These projects are just a way to be creative and and remember, um, you know, what's so important about public education. And the legacy George Washington Carver leaves for generations to come. Well, I just hope the teachers are, are just as committed and dedicated as they were then. Uh, now. It's just the fact that we as people need to appreciate who we are, where we came from, and so that way we can understand where we're going to go. Now, this whole project had a lot of helping hands, including the Cooper Foundation. The installation is expected to be complete soon, but of course, you can't rush art. For more information, head on over to KCENTV.com. I don't know why you ever put them away. <laughs> well, it is Monday, which means it's time for a brand new Morning Munchies. Yeah, and in honor of Black History Month, our Texas Today foodie, Dominic Gonzalez, he visited a local spot serving food for the soul. Located on 719 South 11th Street in Waco, Sassy Southern Style Eatery fills souls with love and stomachs with delicious homestyle cooking. My name is Marsha Neal. Um, everybody call me Sassy. 
I was the events coordinator for the campus out of TSTC. And they start asking me to bring certain dishes for Black History Month. About five years later, I started doing little caterings here and there. And I told John, I think we got something here. My wife has always been a people person. I myself, I cook. I find my solace in the cooking. I do, I care about what people think. When they put something in their mouth and you see the stars in their eyes. Mr. John recommended this. This is his oxtail soup. And he said that this is a, a signature for him. So we're gonna try this first. So the oxtail, here's, here's some of the oxtail. Yeah. That's also very tender. 10 out of 10. And that goes for the rest of the food options, including cabbage, corn, rice, and beef tips. This was only today's menu though, because Sassy's is a buffet style restaurant, rotating between beef, chicken, pork, or seafood options every day. While John handles the main course on the daily, Sassy herself focuses on the desserts. These are all made fresh in-house. We have sweet potato pie, homemade butter pound cake, buttermilk pie, and uh, banana pudding is what put us on the map. I wanted to take the twist out of soul food because people characterize when you say soul food. But soul food is something that satisfies the soul, the inner man, something that's good, something that's filling. One of the things that always gets me the most is, man, it tastes just like my grandma. When I was a kid, that tastes just like what I was raised up on. I get a lot of that, but I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. For 6 News, I'm Dominic Gonzalez. Oh, delicious. You can visit KCENTV.com right now for a more detailed look into Sassy's story. Now, Micah, mm -hmm. I got to ask, is there a, a soul food dish that you can make? That Ooh. you like to make? Okay, I can make this, but with the help of my air fryer, I can make some mac and cheese, Ooh. fried chicken. Um, I can make green beans. I, I'm not too, okay. too, too special okay, with the greens. Okay, look at you. Yeah. Dinner at Micah's. All right, well, <laughs> we'll be back after the break. As part of our Black History Month coverage, tonight we bring you the story of a special group of kids here in Central Texas. What makes them stand out? Well, they play djembe drums, a centuries old instrument originally from West Africa. Six News reporter Jordan Sarter Francis got a chance to hear them play and shows us what makes them create a beat. Centuries ago in Africa, this would be a village call to gather everyone around. But today in Central Texas, Zylea, Janae, Antoine, Robert, and Abriana are just cousins, passionately doing what they love and keeping a centuries-old tradition alive. Playing the same beats when djembe drums, like many Afro-Caribbeans and Africans, did many years ago. Like actually participating in the things that they did when they were younger, doing it ourselves too. The cousins are of Haitian descent. Black ties to the Caribbean are often forgotten about during Black History Month. But on the first weekend of February, the drummers of the Songhai Bamboo Roots Association are sounding off with pride. The djembe drum, made of wood and real goat skin, holds therapeutic value for the person playing it. I play with my emotions, mm -hmm. so whenever I'm feeling the drum feels it. She's like, One time we was, <laughs> we was practicing, and she was like, boom, boom, boom. And I was like, dang, what happened at school today? Like, oh my gosh. And even from the back of the room, that energy, that passion, you still can hear it. Drumming is a very tactile uh, operation, and it works well with kids sometimes that have issues sitting still. Rodney Duckett founder of a local outreach program, also uses drums to aid with troubled youth in the juvenile justice system. As amazing as the drum rhythms may sound, he says the drums are practical tools being used in behavior regulation of children. Because it's disciplined, so we're not doing anything that we're not supposed to be doing. Yeah, and sometimes my grandma, she's like, oh, well, if you act up at school, you don't get to participate in this event. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I have to write, act right at school. It just, like, gets my mindset right. Despite the many reasons why these young people may drum, you have to admit, 
it does sound good. Jordan Sartar Francis reporting for us tonight. That was the Songhai Bamboo Roots Association. They have performances all year round and not just in February. On the football field or the battlefield, Coach Ma Maurice Lane inspires his students every single day. And he's getting that opportunity at his own alma mater. I stopped by his class at Colleen High School to hear more. Most of them call me Coach Lane, either Coach Lane or Coach. Um, I see him pass kids in the hallway and they're like, hey Coach Lane, hey what's up Coach Lane? Coach Lane is the kind of a guy you can talk to. He shows real care. Coach Lane, he'll shoot you a smile. He'll give you a little tap on the shoulder, let you know that there's someone there for you, not just the rest of the eyes in the hallway. You could say Maurice Lane becomes the heart. Remember the minimum is 100. That's the key. Of every family he joins, his brothers and parents to his football family. Help me just, just get through uh, all the, the transitioning from moving, being a military brat. We moved every three to four years. But his dad's last duty station brought him to Colleen, where he graduated high school. And then... I'm getting a full scholarship to Baylor University. Um, I played safety out there. I started off four years. It was three-time uh, all-conference. Part of the prestigious Legends Honor, he joined the Army Reserves after his football career. As soon as I got out of AIT, which is the initial training, they sent me to Iraq. So I spent nine months in Iraq, and I came back right before Christmas, December 22nd. From there, I decided I want to come back to Texas. Coming home to Colleen High School and a new classroom family on and off the field. There's teachers that care. It really, like, uh, it makes the students feel more invested in what's being taught, how it's being taught, and especially because the teachers care who it's being taught by. He does really well when it comes to understanding what kids struggle with. He pushes them towards their um, successfulness. Coach Lane is the inclusion and special education teacher and the high school's strength and conditioning coach. But so much of his legacy will be the inner strength he encourages in his students and athletes. Earn not given. So uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. So they, they, have to, they have to earn their grades. And so I like that competitive nature to say, hey, just because we're the underdog doesn't mean we can't be on top. We can still be on top. He says the village that supported his family growing up is what he's a part of now, offering a high five or a listening ear when students need it. Push, pray until something happens. So continue to pray, um, whether it's good or bad, just continue to pray until something happens. And believe it or not, Coach Lane was a drill sergeant when he was in the Army Reserves. Most of the records as well set by Coach Lane at Baylor are still in place. And in 2015, he was honored as one of the Baylor football legends. As we continue our Black History Month celebration, we highlight a Temple man with an incredible story to tell. Six News reporter Jordan Sarder Francis spoke with the family of a local celebrated black figure. Jordan, so how are they choosing to remember their ancestor? Chris and Lindsay, Larry Womack is telling the story of his great grandfather the way it was told to him by his elders. That was Jeff Hamilton. Jeff Hamilton was my great grandfather and his son was my grandfather. Larry L.J. Womack, born and raised in Temple, couldn't be more proud of the man his great grandfather was. A man who was a slave taught to read in a time where literacy was denied to blacks and a man who became the first free black man to arrive in Bell County. Sam Houston purchased Jeff Hamilton off the auction block at the age of eight years old as a playmate for his kids. And he raised him up as a member of the family. Taught him how to read and write, use knife, forks and spoons and everything. LJ said the famed Sam Houston ensured that Hamilton would have a comfortable life when he passed. Hamilton was able to move to Temple as a free man and begin work at the University of Mary Hardin Baylor, a welcome job for a colored man who knew how to read at a welcome location that would enshrine his legacy for generations to come. That swimming pool right here mainly. They named that swimming pool after him. That was right here. They named it Jeff Hamilton Swimming Pool and it opened in 1946. The pool was a colored pool and a welcomed amenity for blacks in Temple who were barred from the whites only pool across town. It's now a basketball court. Play dominoes, cards, box, pig box, whatever, you know. A little bit of everything inside of that building and all the playground equipment was right out there in the front. 
The park where the Jeff Hamilton Pool once was is named the Jeff Hamilton Park. And although it looks different than it did in the 1940s and 50s, LJ still loves talking about it and the man is named after. <laughs> now you ask me, what, ask me some more questions. Jeff Hamilton Park is located at 501 14th Street in Temple. There you will find a memorial with pictures and more details of his life. Guys. Yeah, what a great interview. Yeah, that was awesome. Jordan. You can imagine a lot of kids playing in the park and they need to know the story as well. Jordan, yeah. thanks so much. As our Black History Month coverage continues, tonight we're highlighting an important piece of black education at College Station. The former Lincoln High School for College Station's black students now stands as a public community center for many different events. Six News reporter Andrea Ribe takes us down memory lane of what the school once was. The Lincoln Recreation Center holds decades of memories, as it was previously known as Lincoln High School, the social hub for College Station's black community. And for Black History Month, we have a former student who goes down memory lane with us. Although the school's motto was forward forever, backward never, Faye Daly is looking back on a time when her high school peers were her family. It made me feel real great, you know, to be able to be among people, you know, that cared for you in the community, community as a whole, you know. We just, there was a real closeness, you know, that we cared about one another. One of her greatest memories was being part of one of the last graduating classes of Lincoln High. I was a class of 64 and I was crowned Miss Lincoln in November of 1963, and that was a great, great night. You know, I didn't realize that I was going to be the one to get it. Her time at Lincoln was nurtured by mentors who cared about uplifting their students despite their circumstances. Some of the teachers, there are some teachers that were looked like more closer to me, and they wanted me to really excel and do, and I still remember those memories, those ones, they have passed on, but they always look like they wanted me to exceed and thing. You know, I didn't, ha I was, I was unfortunate to be able to go on to college because, you know, you know, my, the financials and stuff like that away was. Daly found success in several different careers, including working at Texas a and University. I was determined to put forth the best and try to be the best that I could be with the help and the, with the education that I did have. Her lessons from Lincoln made her capable of making the most out of life and she passes these lessons on to the future. Sometimes I tell my grandchildren, great grandchildren, what I had to go endure it and go, you can do it, you know. Don't complain and just go on because you can make it. If I made it, you can make it. For Six News, I'm Andrea Uribe. What a great story. Thank you so much, Andrea. In 1980, the Lincoln Recreation Center was dedicated and has since served as a tribute to the school that once stood in the same site. Faye Daly still visits the Lincoln Center with her peers and shares those stories with everyone. For more information, visit KCNTV.com. Temple Civic Theater is in its 2023-24 season, and one particular play is planning to stand out from the rest. It's called The Mountaintop, and it's about Dr. Martin Luther King's last night alive before his assassination. Six News reporter Jordan Sarter Francis got a chance to sit in on a rehearsal. Jordan, why is this play so monumental to Central Texas? Lindsay Bailey, The Mountaintop has been performed in the West End of London and on Broadway in New York City. Now Central Texans don't have to travel far to see it. You know what the heck I'm talking about. The Mountaintop is an award-winning play by Katori Hall that has been performed on the biggest stages of the West End of London and on Broadway in New York City. The Broadway show starred heavyweight actors Samuel L. Jackson and Angela Bassett. Good news for Central Texans, local actors will be bringing the play to life at the Temple Civic Theater. In the 57 year history of Temple Civic Theater, this is the first all black production. We're talking about an all black cast, a black director, and it is written by a black playwright. The play is set the night before the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. In the play, Dr. King and a motel housekeeper explore MLK's life and legacy in the themes of the movement in which he died for. The actors are focused on the emotions they must bring to life. I feel like this play is going to be a roller coaster of emotions. It's going to take you high, it's going to take you low. It's gonna make people are going to cry, they're going to laugh. Skeeta Jenkins is starring in all five shows as Dr. Martin Luther King. Despite the famous man Dr. King was and the A-list actors that have played the role before, 
Jenkins is comfortable in his own skin. I'm just gonna use my voice and uh, it's, a, it's a tall task, but I think it's one in this season that I'm ready for. The mountaintop is described as surrealistic fantasy according to his playwright, Katori Hall. But for the audience who will be in attendance, the drama will feel like reality. He scared me. How would you know that? Know what? The mountaintop shows March 7th through March 10th. Bailey, Lindsay. Very interesting. I'm so excited and I feel like this is like a huge impact on Central Texas. So definitely grab your tickets now. Yeah, thank you so much, Jordan. Hey, welcome back here to Texas today. It is Black History Month and all new this morning. We are taking you to Limestone County where Washington High School Grossbeck ISD's former all black high school recently became a historical marker. This is a look at it right here. Now I spoke with some of the former students who made it all happen, showing us that black history isn't just a thing of the past. It's being made right now. And what grade were you in during this? In the year, I think I was, uh, I was seventh grade. My sister was eighth, that's her. Having a sister is like having a built-in best friend. We've come a long way. <laughs> and for these sisters, Ethel Harris Moffitt and Brenda Harris Jackson, they're celebrating a recent win in their hometown. You grew up here your entire life? Twice. Born and raised. raised. And graduated, got married, moved away, and came back. And raised all my kids and grandkids. Grandkids who will now know her former school as a historical marker. That's a blessing, because all these years since Washington, no news reporter has, has ever been interested to come to town to want to know anything about Washington. This is cool with so much history. Everybody went to this campus. But first we had to backtrack. Before Washington, there was Blackshear. The school served as Grossbeck ISD's all-black school from 1922 to 1957. And we did our best to progress and to finish because the purpose of going to school is to learn. And in 1957, black Grossbeck ISD students continued to learn, but at Washington High. It was named in honor of Blackshear's principal, Nelson Washington, and served kids first through 12th grade. It was all Washington. That's all we knew. Integration started in 1965 with a freedom of choice policy. I was a junior when we were forced to go to Grosse Bay High School. Washington ended up closing in 1969, but the main building still stood until 2018. But this was our original cafeteria during the time we were here. It is now a cafe for culinary students, while the gym is still being used for middle school students. I really like that, but I believe that it should be more. In September 2023, more finally came. After at least two rejections, Washington finally became a Texas historical marker, but now there's a push for the same to happen to Blackshear. It's history. Uh, uh, you know, for us, it's history. So seeing all this happen, do you think more still needs to be done? I don't see a lot of progress that has been made being grown back since that time period, the 70s. But for now, these sisters are celebrating this win. It was interesting. Different. Very different. <laughs> but we made it. <laughs> uh, made it. They definitely made it and are now thriving. And just to put in perspective, I mean, they're still here. They're still able to tell that story, which shows that it was not that long ago, as many people sometimes often think. Yeah, for sure, Micah. And I do want to point out, she said that no reporter had ever been interested in coming out and telling their story. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say that is just so important and that's why we do what we do mm -hmm. and why it's so important for us to be in the community because had you not gone out there, who knows if that story would have ever gotten told. So Very true. Good story, Mike. Well, this Black History Month, we are highlighting people in our community who are history makers. And this morning, I'm introducing you to Colonel Lakeisha Stokes, the first black female garrison commander on Fort Cavazos. Now I got to spend a day with her to see what life was like as a leader at one of the largest army posts in the nation. Colonel Lakeisha Stokes has been in the army for 30 years and held many leadership positions. But the role of garrison commander is a challenging one that requires leadership, organizational skills, and adaptability. Well, as a garrison commander, I'm, I'm responsible for 
um, sustaining, um, supporting, and, and defending um, um, the installation. In July of 2023, Colonel Stokes became the first African-American woman garrison commander on Fort Cavazos. When she found out she made history on post, she didn't let it go to her head. I'm, I'm a humble person, um, and I think it's, you know, from my, you know, background and how my mom raised me. And so, of course, it's important, and I understand the duties and responsibilities I have here. From overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the garrison to managing the welfare and readiness of soldiers, Colonel Stokes has a lot on her plate. She allowed me to follow her around for a day to get a glimpse of her busy schedule. First stop was at the Fort Cavazos Directorate of Emergency Services to get a briefing on evacuations happening on the west side of the installation. We need to ensure that all the um, evacuees that has, you know, gone to Abrams Gym have all the necessary resources. Then to Heritage Heights, where more than 50 new homes have been built for soldiers. Uh, so, Colonel, kind of talk to me about uh, the importance of these homes for your junior enlisted soldiers. Um, so the importance of these homes is that so when the junior enlisted soldiers, when they come from work, they have a place to come to. And it's, 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 it's more, you know, that home feeling. Renovations are underway at the barracks, and we even spent time at range operations. The demanding position of an Army leader requires a high level of dedication and resilience. And while Colonel Stokes is the first black woman garrison commander on post, she's the second woman. The Army, um, as as the years has, I wouldn't say improved, uh, but now has looked at, you know, females in those major positions, which is, is great for the Army. Mm -hmm. But aside from the military life and behind the uniform, Colonel Stokes is a mom and a wife who enjoys spending time with her family. Doing all those different sporting events with him and, you know, attending the tournaments that he have on a weekend, that's what I enjoy doing and, and just spending time um, with my husband and, and my family. Now, there are many soldiers who may want to one day be in Colonel Stokes shoes. Now, she said her advice to those seeking a leadership position in the Army is to have a positive attitude and work hard every single day because anything is possible. A groundbreaking ceremony for a memorial to enslaved persons took place at Baylor University today. The project at Founders Mall is meant to reflect on and recognize the university's history with slavery. Joining me live in studio with more is 6 News reporter Meredith Haas. Meredith, you were there today. Yeah, that's right, Chris. Leaders of the university gathered today at Founders Mall speaking to the public and university students on how this memorial will impact generations to come. It's really encouraging to me to think about a university that back in the in the in the middle of the 1960s didn't didn't admit black people to the to the university. Reverend Dr. Malcolm Foley, along with other leaders from Baylor and the members of the Commission on Historic Campus Representations. To then to then have a memorial like this in the very center of campus in what will likely be the most significant physical representation on this campus for years to come. It's an it's an inspiring it's an, it's an inspiring message. Gathered to break ground on a memorial that will remember the past for future generations. So going to a university here in the South, especially, that's able to recognize and really dive into their history and get a fuller picture of what it means to be a student here, you know, years ago and now, and just to see the evolution of the Waco community. Limestone from the original university will be used in the memorial build, as it was mostly built by enslaved people. Gaps in the stone build will represent the unknown enslaved and the gaps in Baylor's history, with the waterfall to represent a time of reflection. The only way for us to move forward is to deeply reckon, is to deeply reckon with our past, but not to, but not to stay there, but to recognize, hey, these are the things that we never want to be involved in ever again. Here are the ways that we can build now to make sure that to make sure that that doesn't happen. Now, this is only a groundbreaking. The official dedication and ribbon cutting for this memorial will be made next summer. For more information, head on over to KCENTV.com.
Welcome back. The Brazos Valley is introducing new interactive exhibits for Black History Month in hopes of connecting the past to the present. Six News reporter Andrea Uribe has more on what this museum has to offer. Here at the Brazos Valley African American Museum, residents can come in with free admission during Black History Month and learn more about the black community here in Bryan. The museum is filled with a variety of exhibits, artifacts, and resources about national and local figures. There are new exhibits on the civil rights era as well as older features on influential Brazos Valley educators like Willie A. Tyro, the principal of Lincoln High School in 1946. Museum intern Reagan Smith helps residents see how this history has made an impact on the present. I would definitely say, as you can see, I you would look at me and think I might not have a connection, but there's always something to learn. Um, you can look at just almost any invention and there's probably a chance that there was a black connection somewhere or a black inventor started something. And that is just really important to our everyday lives. Plus it helps you become a more well-rounded member of society by understanding the story of your fellow man. You can understand yourself better and interact better with each other. The community is often unaware of these interactive and accessible pieces of history. The community is always very happy to see a new exhibit out and a lot of times we have people come in and they're like, I didn't even know this was here. So it's a lot of that, but we love having people come and visit and they really are, get interested in new things. The museum is also offering a free family history search program that can connect you to your family history. For 6 News, I'm Andrea Uribe. And as mentioned, the museum will be offering free admission all throughout the month of February. And for more information on their hours or their exhibits, check out our website, kcentv.com. Okay, so as we continue with our Black History Month coverage, there's a new exhibit at the East Waco Library honoring a trailblazer. Well, born in Mejia in 1908, Dr. Emma Harrison dedicated her life to education. She was the first African-American woman elected to the Waco ISD School Board. She also earned a master's and doctorate degrees from the University of Southern California. She taught fourth grade in PE in Waco schools and served as the first female trustee at Paul Quinn College. Now I spoke with her niece who walked me through the exhibit. She says her aunt loved the city of Waco and children and did everything she could to educate them. I think it's important to keep our history going and you can see a lady like her, what she came from in the early days of seg segregation on up to today's, what we can accomplish. In 1950, Dr. Harrison was listed as one of the first African American women admitted to the University of Texas Graduate School. And in 1971, her home on Taylor Street in East Waco was entered into the Texas State Records as a Texas historical landmark. Now the exhibit was put on display by the Central Texas African American Heritage Foundation. If you would like to check it out, it is located at the East Waco Library on Elm Avenue for about another month.